Good evening, and I want to welcome uh, everyone to a, another late night episode of the Trumpet Series Bible Study Broadcast. This is your host, Brother Nick Bailey, coming to you live on this Friday night. Thank goodness it's Friday, right? January the 20th, <laughs> isn't that right? January the 20th, 2023. And um, what a blessing it is to be able to finish out another week uh, and to put a wrap on this week's um, series of broadcasts that God has so graciously allowed us to conduct over the last four days. <clears throat> it's been a trying week, it's been a challenging week, but it's been a productive week and a beneficial week of Bible study. Again, it is... Uh, and a, a great undertaking to um, prepare for these uh, broadcasts, put the time, for effort, and energy that's required to get them ready, and then to uh, make sure I'm faithful in all my other obligations and responsibilities uh, uh, in the ministry, and then find time to actually uh, preach. Uh, the broadcast itself and provide it as God would have me to. But God's grace is sufficient, and Lord willing, if I make it through tonight's episode, then uh, we'll be able to say praise the Lord uh, for His faithfulness. Even if I don't make it uh, through it, uh, we could all still say that He's faithful. So, um, we've got uh, Sunday morning worship coming up, the Lord's Day. The day after tomorrow, and I want to encourage everybody to be faithful uh, to your um, local church Sunday morning uh, service on the Lord's Day, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Uh, your church needs you, and you need the church. And... Um, also, I do want to mention this, here in Greenville in the morning at 11 o'clock a.m., uh, we'll get, be gathering at the local courthouse downtown here in Greenville, and we'll be having a special time of prayer on behalf of our community, uh, our state, and especially our nation. Uh, and just in case you're concerned about the weather, when it's cold, we have an indoor uh, shelter uh, that that is afforded to us so that we don't freeze to death. So come out and support us at 11 o'clock. It, it doesn't take long. Uh, we're usually out there uh, by 11.30 or shortly thereafter. But again, we need to pray. Greenville, Green County, Tennessee needs prayer. The United States of America needs prayer tonight more than it ever has. Um, let me just run a couple of rabbits. When you have over 200 congressmen and women that vote against protecting the lives of uh, babies who have recently been born, you know something is wrong, whether or not we like to admit it. Uh, we're in the process of seeing infanticide, not just the killing of unborn, but uh, uh, born babies. Uh, you know something's wrong. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're normalizing infanticide here in America. If you think God's going to bless that, you're crazy. He's not going to tolerate what's occurring in our land right now forever. And I don't know about you, but I was sickened when I heard about one of the Congress women who voted against protecting the lives of babies that have been born. Uh, she had the gall, the nerve, and the audacity to quote Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 in a weak and desperate attempt to justify the vote she cast. The Bible says there, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations." And friend, that right there shows you just how wicked, depraved, and immoral our country has become. 
that one of our national leaders would be so reprobate, so deceived and so blind that she would be willing to blaspheme the Word of God publicly in such a way. And by the way, I've heard that there's uh, some things going on that are just as bad, if not even worse, and we'll get to that when we verify them. Um, by the way, I'm not preaching yet. <laughs> but unless this lady repents of her wicked ways and calls on Jesus to forgive her of her sin. You know, if I were a gambling man, I'd be willing to bet the farm that that Congress lady is going to split hell wide open. You say, but she claims to be pro-choice, a pro-choice believer in Jesus. Friend, that's like saying there's such a thing as Christian pornography, Christian pedophilia, Christian drugs and alcohol, Christian homosexuality and transgenderism, and even Christian murder, or theft. You can put the Christian label or name, tag on it all you want to, but if it's contrary to what the Bible says, it's not Christian, it's not of God, uh, but it's out of the pits of hell and it's manufactured by none other than the devil itself. There is no such thing uh, as, uh, amen, a pro-choice born-again Christian. All right, that's enough of that. Let's pray and we'll get into the Bible study portion. Again, if you have a prayer request you'd like to mention, please put it in the comment, comment section of the live stream and we'll do our best to mention it on the following day's broadcast. Please continue to pray. And I do, I covet your prayers for this ministry. You know, I, I've got uh, many other things that I could be, I promise you, I've got many, many other things I could be doing if I thought that uh, this was a waste of time. Uh, you know, I really believe the Trumpet Series broadcast is ordained by God. Uh, pray that His hand of favor would be upon it, that the Lord would continue to use it, enlarge its coast, expand its outreach, so that as many people as possible might be able to hear clear, simple, verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the Word of God. As we do our best here on the Trumpet Series, to spare not, but to cry loud and to lift up our voices like a trumpet. All right, let's pray and we'll get into the, the Bible study uh, portion of today's broadcast. Father in heaven, I love you and I thank you for your goodness. Thank you, dear Lord, for, um, uh, Lord, uh, another week of grace that you've bestowed upon us and allowing us to conduct these, pro pro uh, these programs. And Lord, I pray that uh, tonight's, Lord, would be uh, Lord, the uh, icing on the cake for the week. And Lord, I pray that we would glean uh, from the things that we've studied and we've learned. And, and God, that um, Lord, it, that we wouldn't be mere hearers or learners of the Word of God, but we'd be faithful obeyers and doers of the Word that's been uh, so graciously and mercifully provided to us. God, use me tonight, enlighten uh, my eyes, illuminate my mind, soften my heart. Uh, Lord, anoint my lips, God, that I might faithfully declare, thus saith the Lord. God, I pray that your word would um, uh, fall on good ground and bear fruit in and, and and our lives, all of our lives. And Lord, I pray that your word might be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We'd hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Honor your word by way of humble servant and exalt your son. In doing so, we'll praise you for what you're going to do. If there might be one that's lost listening or watching the program, uh, we pray that you would see fit to draw them unto yourself and save them by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, during yesterday's episode of the broadcast, we spent our time discussing the incredible amount of material and subject matter that exists within the confines of chapter number 8, verse number 26 of the book of Romans. And uh, honestly, I must admit that I myself have been greatly overwhelmed over the last two days with all of the many spiritual nuggets and treasures the Lord's been helping me to dig up out of these verses. It's kind of like when you're trying to get a parcel of ground ready for seed to be sown into it. You know that in order to, um, uh, to uh, obtain a, a, um, a healthy st uh, stand of grass, you got to make sure, or a, or a 
or a healthy garden, you've got to get as many of the rocks out of the garden as you possibly can. And um, uh, amen. Uh, but it seems like the more that you, uh, that, that you dig and the more that you sift through the dirt, and uh, just when you think that you found all the rocks, then you find a few more. And uh, most of the time, no matter how much time you spend sifting or digging for rocks in the dirt Lord, that could hinder the grass um, or the crop from growing, uh, you just keep finding more rocks. And if you think that you're going to remove every single rock out of um, amen, a parcel of, 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 of ground, you just might as well forget about it because it's simply not going to take place. And um, that's why, or that's the way the Bible is when it comes to all the gold nuggets and precious treasures that lie beneath the soil of the Scripture. No matter how hard you study, no matter how much time you see, spend sifting through the soil, of the scripture, you just keep finding more and more gems, more jewels, diamonds, pearls, gold nuggets that need to be dug out. One thing about it, you'll never exhaust the Word of God. You can spend a lifetime studying the Bible and when it's all said and done, uh, amen, your honest testimony would be, I've yet to scratch the surface. The half has yet been told of all the things that are contained within uh, the, 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 the treasure-filled soil of the Word of God. Isaiah 28, um, 9 through 14, let me, let me say this. Uh, one thing that I find to be the case, more so in my life, as I put it into practice, and that is that exhaustive verse-by-verse -verse Bible study where you do your best to rightly divide the Word of Truth and expound individual passages of Scripture within their proper context, it can be grueling, demanding, and the hardest of hard work. Isaiah 29, 9-14, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? By the way, doctrine is biblical. Can I get a witness tonight? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast... For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Um, and then he, he makes a controversial statement, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people, to whom he said, That is the rest. Well, you know, when you read this, uh, oh my goodness, uh, there it is. There's biblical evidence for speaking in tongues. It's a prophecy. No, my friend... What the Bible's saying within its context is that because God, God's people rejected knowledge, because they refused to be weaned off of the, the milk of the Scriptures, and uh, they just simply uh, rejected this idea of studying God's Word precept upon precept and line upon line, here a little and there a little, as a result... Um, the consequences of their rebellion and rejection would be that um, he would cause them to speak with stammering lips. Uh, or, excuse me, he would cause them to hear his word with stammering lips. And, uh, amen, when God spoke his word to his people, it was as if they would be hearing him speak in a language that they could not understand. Boy, doesn't, it, uh, make, doesn't the Bible make sense when you interpret it within its proper context? That's called spiritual blindness. When God blinds you because you choose to willfully and pre presumptuously reject the truth of Scriptures. To whom He said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. What not, <laughs> amen, some unknown tongue or stammering lips, but... Uh, amen. The truth and the doctrine and the meat of scriptures. That is what is, uh, amen, a rest uh, for our souls. Uh, and, this is, and, and that is what causes us to be refreshed. Biblical truth will res refresh your life more so than anything else. Yet they would not hear. Didn't want anything to do with it. For the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, 
precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they may go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. And this, when boy, this is a deep truth, and that is the purpose of God, the giving out of God's Word is not always that they might re- receive it. But sometimes God gives His gives the gives uh, reveals truth to his people to provide them with a consequence and a form of accountability uh, to hold them responsible for their own judgment uh, amen that's why we cannot uh, try to manipulate the results uh, and and again this is deep truth but it's not always the will of God for or it is the will of God but it's not a, a, a always according to God's divine purpose for His people or for people to receive truth. Sometimes uh, the, in, the intent, the reason He gives it out is because He knows it will be rejected and the truth is given out so that He will hold them accountable and hold them responsible for that which they have rejected, the true condition of their heart. Wherefore, hear the word of God, ye scornful men, uh, uh, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Alright, that's enough of that, but now, and boy, we could preach on that all, all day long. But let's get into the context of today's study. Tuesday we talked about verses 19 through 22, uh, the groanings of creation. Wednesday, we said that from verses 23 on down through verse 25, Paul writes to us about the groanings of the Christian or the convert. Then on yesterday's broadcast, we began examining verses 26 and 27. We hope we were, you know, my, my desire was to get through both verses, 26 and 27, yesterday. But boy, uh, I was overwhelmed just to see how much substance that there was within the confines of these two uh, individual verses. Uh, but again, we're talking about the groanings of the comforter. And if you want to find out more regarding those truths, I suggest you go back and either watch or listen to all three of this week's previous episodes of the program. You know, I'll do my best uh, to ensure that it is not a waste of your time. You will glean, maybe not the most flamboyant or charismatic uh, or sensational delivery of Bible truth, but uh, I'm going to do my best to feed you with the uh, fresh bread and the meat of the scriptures. Uh, Amen. So again, at the end of yesterday's broadcast, we finished up our study of verse 26 of Romans chapter 8. So let's uh, do our best to get through the entirety of verse 27 here tonight. Next Tuesday, we'll uh, delve into and dive into a fresh section. Romans 28. Wow. Really? That's where we're going to start next week. One of the most uh, powerful verses in all the Word of God, Romans chapter 28, and moving on down into it. Man, we thought that this week's study was deep. Just wait till next week. I may, I may not uh, get any sleep next week. Maybe delivering these broadcasts at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And if so, it would not be the first time. Hallelujah. There's an examination, and he that searcheth the hearts. Um, with this first statement of verse 27, Paul introduces this verse by reminding his audience how the Lord our God is in the business of searching the hearts and lives of His people. And here I believe the word searcheth is the key word of the verse and it's translated for the, from the Greek word urineo, which means to inquire or to investigate. And notice how that this word has an ETH ending. Uh, in the King James Bible, causing it to be in the continual tense, meaning that God does not just examine our hearts occasionally or periodically, but in a constant and continuous manner. It's like God uh, is always walking around carrying a a magnifying glass. He is, uh, uh, amen, He is a professional, uh, he's He's a private investigator, always examining and always doing a, uh, uh, a, an internal inventory uh, uh, just to, to, to inspect the condition of the hearts of His people. That, that, that's a sobering thought, isn't it? 
Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest me, my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. That should cause all of us to find an altar of repentance right there to to to, to you know, consider uh, and to meditate on this idea that God knows everything. Uh, that we see everything that we do, everywhere we go, everything we say, every thought that we think, every motive and every intent of our heart, every desire that we have. God knows. Can't You can hide it from... Uh, from uh, other people, you can deceive others, but you cannot deceive God. Verse 23 and 24 of that same chapter, Psalm 139, then the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And personally, I believe the last two verses of this chapter have a twofold dual meaning. First of all, I believe the psalmist was not afraid or hesitant and boy, this is, man, this is, uh, amen, this is eye-opening here, but was instead actually able to embrace and to welcome the idea of the Lord doing an examination and in inventory of His own heart. So let me just ask you and myself today, does it bother you to consider, does it bother me to consider this thought of the Lord doing an exhaustive search and a thorough examination of our hearts and lives? Uh, amen. I mean, if God, you know, just like when you have unexpected company showing up at your house and the laundries, there's dirty laundry uh, strewn all over the floor. I'm sure some of you don't know anything about that, right? Uh, you got dirty dishes in the sink and dust on the table and uh, the floor hadn't been vacuumed or swept or mopped. The house is dirty because you were not expecting company. Does it bother you to know that the Lord regularly shows up to do an inspection, a very detailed inspection of the contents of your heart? Uh, amen. I'm talking about the Lord opening the door and turning the lights on, all the hidden rooms that exist, taking up the rug and uncovering all the dirt that's under it, cleaning out all those secret closets and pantries where we have all those hidden skeletons. We don't want anyone else to know about. Uh, skimming through all the cracks and the crevices. You know, just to uncover the dirt that exists in their hearts. Is that something that excites you and brings pleasant thoughts into mind in your mind? Or is it something that horrifies you and makes you sick at your stomach to even think, of, think about? The psalmist embraced this idea that he, he invited, he welcomed. Uh, he wanted God to search his heart. Uh, amen. That puts me under conviction. But also I believe these two verses at least imply the idea that as the Lord searched his heart, David, who is the writer of this psalm, wanted the Lord to reveal all the things he found that might at the same time have been hidden from him. And those things that even he, not God, but David himself might not even be aware of. You know, it's, it's possible for the Lord to, to, to know the condition of your heart, but for you to be uh, misconstrued and misguided and confused about you know, whether or not your heart really and truly is right with God. One thing about it, God knows you and God knows me, me better than we know ourselves. The psalmist wanted God to reveal those things to him so that to ensure that there was absolutely nothing in his heart and life that would hinder God's ability to have absolute, total, and complete fellowship with the Lord his God. Uh, you know, David was, again, one of the, the, the great men of the Bible in spite of his faults, failures, and sins. Uh, reminds us a lot of ourselves, if we were to be honest. Uh, but David was a great worker. He was a great warrior for the Lord. But, but if you want to, um, to, to identify 
the primary attribute and characteristic of David's life, uh, I think you will come to the conclusion that more than anything else, David was a worshiper of the Lord his God. He wasn't perfect, and I'm glad that we don't have to be perfect to be worshipers of God. The Lord is in the business of seeking such. He's seeking sinners who might have a desire to worship Him. But when I think about David's life, again, he was a passionately devoted worshiper of Jehovah. And no doubt about it, Israel's greatest king took his personal worship more seriously than he did any other area of his life. I'm telling you, more than your job, more than your family, uh, amen, more than your hobby, your form of entertainment, the stock market, your 401k, all of these other things should be secondary uh, in light of the responsibility and the great privilege you have to be a worshiper of Jehovah God. Uh, and because of that, David recognized that any hidden or secret sin that existed within the realm of his own heart served as the greatest threat to be able to worship the Lord uh, as closely and as intimately as he wanted to. Uh, and because of that, David wanted to know the contents of his heart. Uh, he wanted uh, his life, he, he, again, he welcomed that light. He, he wanted God to, to turn the light on in his heart, expose the darkness, expose the threats that, uh, uh, that, that caused danger, that threatened him. Uh, to not be, as, be able to worship God as intimately as, and as closely as he wanted to do. So he embraced God revealing the secret sins uh, and the unsurrendered areas of his life. Uh, amen. He wanted absolute transparency in his heart and life. And we ought to follow his example. It's not easy. It's not pleasant. But it's necessary if we want to uh, be able to tap into the fullness of our potential as it relates to our uh, ability to worship God the way He wants us to. Not just publicly, but privately. Uh, he didn't want to view His own heart uh, through a cloudy lens as if He was looking through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13. But instead, He wanted His personal view of His own life to be absolutely and totally transparent so he could see the Lord face to face and so he could know himself even as he also was known by God. Friend, that ought to be a, a daily prayer uh, of yours. Each and every single day that you bow your bended knee and lift up your, your eyes into the hills from whence cometh your help because your help comes from God. I'm telling you a part of your, a regular part of your, uh, your daily prayer life ought to say, Lord, and God, I pray that you would help me by your amazing and marvelous grace to know myself and the condition of my own heart and life as I also am known by you. Help me to see myself as you see me. Now you better be careful what you ask for because you might not like what you see. Friend, if we're ever going to be able to approach or even get anywhere near the potential level of fellowship that is available to us. Uh, then as hard of a thing as it is to do sometimes, we must have that same passionate desire the psalmist had, which was to know himself even as he also was known by the Lord his God. Uh, simply put, it's time for God's people to quit living lives that are willfully blind and uh, ignorant of their own spiritual condition it's time for all of us to face the music, accept the facts, swallow, swallow the bitter uh, medicine that most of us have no desire whatsoever to swallow. But friend, it may not taste good going down, but it'll help you, amen, to uh, do a, an honest evaluation and a regular inventory of your heart so that you might know yourself and see the, con the true and the real condition of your heart, even as God knows it to be. And that is, listen, it's not, and I believe Paul wrote this uh, when he said, uh, 
you know, it's not about what people think about us. It's not, you know, when we stand before God, we will not be judged by the opinions of others, and we won't even be judged based upon our opinion of our own selves. You know, it, it, it really doesn't matter uh, in the long run what you think of yourself. And the truth is most of us think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think because we are, uh, because our hearts are consumed and saturated with, a, with an attitude of pride and arrogance. We think more highly. But friend, when God judges you, he, your life, when you stand before Him, He is not going to take into consideration at all the high or low opinion you know it doesn't matter what you think of yourself how you evaluate the condition of your own heart but God's going to judge you according to what the Bible says and what he knows to be true about you you know as a whole and generally speaking we aren't within the confines most of us uh, of the same galaxy to where we could be should be and would be if we'd only be able to know of you and see ourselves even as we also are known by God. And friend, the only way to do that and the only way to get a clear and accurate and transparent vision and view of our own spiritual lives is to regularly, you listen to me tonight, this is the primary purpose of the Trumpet Series. And that is uh, to continuously and constantly Gaze within the clear and unbiased mirror of God's holy word. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. You say, how do I do that? Get in the book. Amen. Stay in the book. Amen. You cannot, hey listen. Uh, amen. You'll see, <laughs> you'll see the face of Jesus in the fullness of His glory by reading and studying your Bible, much more so than you will uh, by having some dream or vision of Jesus standing at the foot of your bed because you ate too much pizza the night before, can I get a, a witness? God's mirror, God's, uh, God's glass, His clear glass, uh, and His unbiased mirror of the Holy Word of God, uh, amen, it don't lie, brother, I mean... It doesn't cut any corners. I looked at a picture. Somebody took a picture of me and a couple other fellas eating lunch today. And boy, I didn't like what I saw. Uh, amen. In, in other words, my opinion of, how, uh, of my, uh, my own appearance, what I thought of myself physically was somewhat different than what the picture showed that uh, a friend of mine took of me sitting at that table eating lunch. That's what God's Word will do in your life. Amen. It's not biased. Amen. It's, it's unmerciful. God's Word is unmerciful uh, as it relates to the way it reveals uh, the condition of your heart and life to be. 2 Corinthians 3.18 We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I had a preacher that recently ridiculed me and made fun of me because I referred to uh, the Word of God as a glass or a mirror. Well, I'm just, <laughs> I guess you're ridiculing Scripture because that's what the Bible says. James 1, 23 through 25, For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he bringeth, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That's the purpose of a mirror, to get an honest reflection of your appearance, not just so you can uh, remain in the same condition, but to make the necessary changes that need to be made because of what you see as uh, amen, uh, your image reflects the true condition of your physical appearance reflects off of the mirror that you're looking at. And uh, simply put, you'll never change or be changed until you see that you need to change. Let me say that again. You'll never change or be changed until you see the need to be changed. Uh, and the only way to ensure that happens is to continuously 
examine ourselves daily within the magnifying glass of God's Word to keep us humble and to ensure that we are not guilty of uh, overestimating uh, our own level of spirituality. Sad to say the overwhelming majority of God's people think of themselves to be way more spiritual than what they really are. And tragically, most of us don't even have a clue uh, when it comes to just how unspiritual, unholy, and unrighteous we really are. Many of us view the condition of our hearts to resemble, uh, uh, accurately resemble an operating room prepared for surgery that has been completely sterilized of any foreign substance or own, uh, unknown bacteria that may defile the body. Uh, that the surgery is performed on. When in reality God sees and God views our hearts to more closely resemble a garbage dump or a landfill that is filled to the brim with all kinds of rotting and putrefying filth. Uh, amen. We, we, see, we view our hearts as a, as a sanitized, uh, amen, and sterilized uh, room that's prepared for surgery when in reality God sees the dwelling place of our hearts uh, as a garbage dump filled with all kinds of rotting uh, trash. And uh, I'm afraid that when God examines the majority of the hearts uh, and lives of His people, He's sickened by the foul odor of a septic tank rather than uh, the fresh aroma of uh, a sanctuary prepared for the dwelling place of His presence. On the other hand, and I, I'm, I'm getting somewhere, I'm getting ready to move on, but I mean, I got off on a tangent and I wanted to finish it. Uh, praise the Lord. Mo some of us are either hesitant or, are absol or we absolutely refuse and are totally unwilling to do a regular inventory of our hearts because... <laughs> We're afraid of what we might find. And instead we'd rather remain willfully ignorant and blind as we mistakenly think that uh, what we know won't hurt us, which is the furthest thing from the truth. One of the greatest lies the devil could ever tell you is that uh, what you know won't hurt you and that you'd, better, uh, you'd be better off remaining ignorant of the facts than to know the truth. Friend, uh, amen. Regardless of whether or not I know I have cancer, uh, amen, if cancer, uh, if, there's a, if, if my body is infested with tumors, uh, even if I don't know it, I'm still going to die unless I am treated properly. Well, as the old saying goes, sin will either keep you from the book or the book will keep you from sin, and that right there is the main reason why some of us, if not most of us, don't spend more time searching, searching and examining the condition, condition of our hearts and lives with the magnifying glass of God's precious Word. Why? Because we're afraid, in some cases, we're afraid of what we're going to find, and in other cases, we already know what we're going to find. And we just want to avoid it and ignore it and act as if it doesn't exist. But all the time, amen, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's rising up into the presence of God as a filthy stench in His nostrils. Friend, if you really want to know yourself as God knows you, you'll be willing to get in, stay in, and keep your nose dug way down in the Bible as deep as you possibly can. And as you pray and ask the Lord to do so, He'll reveal the true condition of your heart and you'll be able to know yourself even as you also are known by God. All right, man, we could just conclude today's study with that one truth, but we're going to move on. Harmonization. Knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. In this statement, the word knoweth is translated from the Greek word phronema. And all this, although this word can have multiple different meanings, I believe here it means to be of the same uh, mind or to have the same mindset. Or we might say that there is a great similarity and a common likeness between the mindset or the disposition of the Father and the Spirit and thank God for it. You see, the Father and the Spirit are able to work together and cooperate 
with one another because of the common likenesses and the similar mindsets that they have with each other. And this goes back to Romans chapter 3, verse 3, and yes, I'm getting ready to run another tangent. The Bible asks the question, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And we know, in spite of what we're told by secular society, that I, and, and can I just say, in a lot of times, religious, modern day religious uh, society, our ability to cooperate and work together depends greatly uh, upon the likenesses we have with each other. And as people, if we can't find some common ground we agree on, some common likenesses, some common interest, and some common inclinations, and that word inclination simply means that we're bent towards each other rather than to, to be bent away from each other. Uh, again, that we're able to rally around and work in harmony with, with each other. There can be no harmony without truth. There cannot be any unity without truth. Uh, harmony is, uh, amen, Har both harmony and unity are founded in and grounded upon truth, the foundation of truth. Amen. Anything else is nothing more than a straw man in a house of cards. You know, we, listen, if we can't find some common likeness, interest, or ground that is similar, that doesn't mean that we're going to agree exactly with each other on everything. For those of you who are watching, you've probably already found things tonight that I've said that you don't agree on, and that's okay. I'm not here to conform you to my beliefs and my ideas, unlike some preachers. Amen. You're, you're a sinner going to hell if, unless you... Uh, line up with them and dot every I and cross every T just exactly like that, they do. But I'm just telling you tonight, regardless of what, uh, amen, the ecumenical world may tell you, the grounds of uh, our fellowship as Christians is based upon the similarities and likenesses we have with one another, 2 Corinthians 6, 14-16. And boy, uh, some of you are going to like this. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? And that relates to the realm of business. Uh, that relates to the realm of friendship. And certainly it relates to the realm of marriage. Amen. You, not, you, 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 you ought not enter into any yoke or covenant with somebody, uh, amen, that is not... Uh, to the best of your ability, you know them to be a saved, born-again child of God. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Here's a good one. Ha what concord hath Christ with Belial? How, how, can a, how, can, how can God, who is holy, and the devil, who is unholy, uh, coexist together in, in, a, in a confined space or area? Can I get a witness? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. He didn't say that the devil will dwell in you. Or a demon, uh, amen, a demonic spirit will dwell in you. He said, God will dwell in you. And he'll walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And let me just go ahead and get it out of the way. If you think the devil and the Holy Ghost can go coexist, occupy the same house, and dwell together in the same residence, you're crazy. As the old saying goes, this house just ain't big enough for the both of us. And that certainly applies to the house and the tabernacle of our bodies. If you think that the Holy Spirit of God and some demon or devil are going to be able to coexist and uh, occupy the same house, then I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona that I'd like to sell you. And when the light of God's Spirit moves in, then you better believe that the darkness of the devil is going to move out. Why? Because, <laughs> and this is just elementary, amen, this shows you just how, uh, how shallow and how spiritually ignorant those who, the, spiritually ignorant, those who can, can succumb to the deliverance doctrine really are. Light and darkness cannot coexist together in the same confined area or space. You know, I, I mean, I've never, 
walked into any room in my house and say that it's both light and dark at the same time. When light comes in, darkness flees. That's a scientific principle that applies to both the physical and the spiritual realm. Uh, you'll never find a room that contains 50% light and 50% darkness. Uh, when light enters, darkness has no other option but to flee. When the Holy Spirit of God uh, barges through the door, amen, and takes up not only occupancy, occupancy but ownership of your heart and life, He ain't going to put up and tolerate with, that, with any stinking demon or devil, I promise you that. Either, uh, you know, when God moves in, in the devil's got to go. And those of you who are on the deliverance gravy train need to hear that. But again, our ability to fellowship and cooperate with one another is based upon the similarities and the likenesses and the common interests that we have with each other. Now we know this is totally contrary to the idea and the philosophy of the modern day ecumenical movement that promotes the idea that unity is always of the Lord, which by the way is not biblical. For example, in the book of Genesis, when God confounded the language, He commanded the people to disperse and separate one from another because the Lord knew the different languages would hinder them from being able to cooperate and work in harmony with each other. And when the people of the earth chose to defy God's order instead of, and instead chose to unify and congregate with each other at a place called Babel, which is the origin, the origin of ecumen, ecumenism, the Lord judged them harshly and severely for it. I'm, I'm saying to you that God judged His people for uniting, uh, amen, with those uh, who were not like them and similar to them. Friends, when people are at odds with one another and when their inclination is against rather than towards each other, in order for them to co cooperate, fellowship, and work in harmony, somebody's going to have to compromise. And that's the problem today. we got too many so-called Christians trying to work together with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, amen. And when you do that, somebody's going to have to give. And somebody's going to have to move their ideas, doctrines, and beliefs in the direction of the one they're at odds with. And what I've had to learn the hard way in my life which has caused some of the fundamental ideas and beliefs I've had regarding ministry to change recently. Uh, in order for we conservative fundamental Bible believers to be able to unite, cooperate, and fellowship with the devil's crowd, the liberal's crowd, and yes, although I don't put them into the same lot, but I would even uh, apply this to the charismatic crowd, then more often than not, we're almost we'll almost always find ourselves being the ones to compromise our doctrines, water down our beliefs, and go soft on our convictions in order to accommodate and get along with them. Uh, amen. The, the, uh, the devil's crowd, the liberal's crowd, and yes, even the, uh, the charismatic crowd, and again, I'm drawing a distinction. They're not all one and the same. But amen, in order to... to uh, to get along with them. Uh, amen. They want you to uh, tolerate and to put up with their beliefs. But friend, the moment you begin to, to, uh, uh, to even mention what you believe uh, regarding the fundamental truths of the Scripture, man, this idea of tolerance and acceptance is over. And you can say what you want to, but this idea that let's just all come together, sing Kumbaya, lay aside our differences, unite with one another and tolerate each other's uh, um, uh, distinctions, all for the sake of peace, harmony, harmony and u unity, it's really a load, what it is is a load of hullabaloo. Because the devil's crowd, you listen to me tonight, friend, this will help you. Amen, I had to learn it the hard way. Some of you better learn before you have to, uh, amen, go through some of the, the same experiences I've had to go through and eat some of the crow I've had to eat and have the mud on my face uh, that I've had to, to wipe off. 
the, li- the devil's crowd, the, the liberal crowd, and yes, even the charismatic crowd, will preach and proclaim tolerance and acceptance all the day long until they're the ones that have to accept and tolerate we uh, conservative Bible-believing fundamental Christians and Baptists. Let me go ahead and say that. You know, the Baptists have always been the, the most unpopular bunch in the entire lot. All of a sudden, tolerance goes out the window, and we almost are always forced to give in to their agenda. Uh, amen. And, 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 and accept their ideas and conform ourselves. Amen. That's why you see some um, preachers that, that we one time had faith and confidence in and looked up to and even learned from because they took a stand for truth. But amen, because they were drawn to those who were more popular and who were uh, at least uh, on the surface seemed to be thriving and prospering. Even though their doctrine was more than just a little uh, questionable and concerning. And in some ways uh, outright and downright heretical. But yet these preachers... Uh, that we used to look up to and we used to respect and we used to have confidence and faith in saying they'd never change and they'd never be a part of the falling away. Now they're the ones that uh, have crossed the line and are at least identifying with, if not conforming their own ideas, their own convictions, their own truths and standards. Uh, to the crowd they used to preach, preach against, but now are willing to, to compromise and sacrifice everything, including their own reputation. Amen. And, and uh, their own character. Uh, amen. They're willing to sacrifice their own name that they have worked, toiled, and labored for decades to build. Just throw it all away. Amen. Just because they want a little piece of the, uh, the popularity pie. And uh, amen. They want to have the name that somebody else has. And they want to, um, uh, amen, uh, they almost are idolizing uh, heretical preachers. And as a result, they are on the very border and some have even crossed the line of getting to the place to where we can rightly uh, identify them as being heretics as well. And if the word heresy or a heretic is too strong of a label to use, an apostate certainly is. Man, I'll tell you, that I know some preachers that are doing things that it wasn't but a year or two ago they were preaching against themselves uh, wearing uh, amen wearing skinny jeans uh, while they preach because they're they, they're, they're, tr- they're trying to imitate uh, the one they're idolizing and worshiping over the Lord their God S- you know using the same catchphrases that another preacher's using, because for uh, the longest time they've been obsessed and infatuated with the heretics. I mean, it's sad. You know, you can go back into the early '90s and listen to messages that those who used to stand where we stand and used to have the same principles and convictions that we did. And the very things that they preach so hard and strongly against uh, 20 and 30 years ago, now they're the ones guilty of doing the very thing. And what's worst of all is they, uh, they gloat about it. Amen. They brag about it. And they're unashamed of the fact that they themselves have stooped to the level of religious 
uh, and ministerial apostasy. My, my. Never forget, friend, that what one generation tolerates, the next generation will, will embrace. And may I go a step further and say that what you tolerate, you will eventually be tempted to accept and embrace yourself. I won't charge you for that one. All I can say to this is the main reason why the Father and, and uh, the Holy Ghost are able to cooperate, fellowship, and work together in absolute unity and harmony is because they are what the, the Bible refers to as being like-minded. And when it comes to the Father and the Spirit, you will always find them in agreement because they are of one mind and of one accord. And I believe that's an example we uh, need to follow as well. One thing about it, friend, you'll never find a wedge, a barrier, an obstruction, a difference, or a disagreement arise between God the Father and God the Holy, Holy Spirit. And why is that so often, or why is that... Um, uh, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here. Tragically, that cannot be always said about the fellowship and the communion even we born-again Christians have with the Lord our God. Uh, amen. And as bad as I hate to admit it, there have been times in my life, even since I've been saved, to where I found myself at odds with the Father, I find myself striving against Him and resisting His will for my life, rather than surrendering and cooperating with His good and perfect plan. But thank God and praise the Lord's high and holy name, you won't ever have to worry about something like that occurring between the Father and the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because they're like-minded. They're inclined to each other, and you will always find them in one mind and one accord. I'm telling you, friends, the Father and the Spirit are knit together so tightly with each other that the devil couldn't drive a wedge between them even if he wanted to. And to that I say, Amen. Glory to God. Let's, let's, let's finish this thing up. Isolation, because he maketh intercession for the saints. Here we see how Paul repeats almost the exact same statement he made previously in verse 26. In fact, the only difference you'll find between the two statements is the usage of the word us in verse 26 versus the word saints in verse 27. And although it would be easy, and I almost did pass this off as being an insignificant difference, what I will say is that I believe the word saints here that is used highlights the special privilege we say born-again Christians have in knowing that the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit really and truly is our... Uh, truly is our heavenly intercessor, our advocate, and our mediator, especially as it relates to our prayers that ascend before the Father's throne. Why? Because not every person in the world has been afforded the, that privilege. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that those who make up the bride of Christ and the church of the living God are the only people in the history of the world who can rightfully, lawfully, and legitimately say that the Holy Spirit serves as the heavenly advocate on behalf of their prayers. Isn't that wonderful? What a blessing. We ought to be thankful for the advocacy of the Holy Spirit of God on behalf of our prayers as well as the advocacy um, that's made available to us by Jesus Christ on behalf of our sins. Again, the Spirit advocates uh, for our prayers. The Son of God, the Savior, advocates and mediates and over our sins. Specification. According to, and this is what we close with tonight, according to the will of God, verse 27. Now here we find what may very well be the most important phrase of this entire two-verse section that deals with the groanings of the comforter. I mean, we've, I mean we have just uncovered... Uh, diamond and, and gold nugget and pearl and jewel and precious stone. Uh, amen. One right after another. But uh, I believe this phrase, according to the will of God, is the rubber band uh, or the string of twine that ties it all together. Friend, what makes all the truths we've discussed over the last two days uh, regarding the intercessory and mediatory work of the Holy Ghost on our behalf 
on behalf of our prayers so significant and so special is because everything Paul has discussed up to this point simply serves as the foundation and sets the stage for this last statement. For example, the reason why it was so necessary for Paul to unveil the like-mindedness, the like-mindedness and the single-mindedness that exists between the Father and the Holy Spirit that causes them to always be able to work in unity with each other is because it gives you and I the confidence to know that we're able, we were always able to trust the Holy Spirit totally, absolutely, and completely in regards to the prayers He prays for us and on our behalf. If I've got somebody praying for me, uh, I want to do my best to make sure that I can trust the prayers that they're praying, that, they, that their prayers are truly getting through and that their, their, their prayers are, uh, are helping my life rather than hurting it. But you know, the Word of God tells us that the Father and the Spirit will always be 100% in agreement with each other. And because of that, we can know uh, with absolute certainty that the prayers that He, again, not it or not she, but He, the Holy Spirit of God, offers up to the Father and on our behalf will always be according to God's will. You may, you may pray a prayer. You may ask amiss, friend, but you don't have to worry about the Holy Ghost ever praying a prayer that is not in 100% complete alignment with God's perfect will for your life. Uh, amen. I must admit, I, I heard a, a preacher that I have great confidence in. I don't think you'd tell a lie. Uh, amen. But he said that uh, everything that he had sincerely asked the Lord for in his life, that God had given that to him. I wish I could say that because the truth of the matter is there's been times that I've asked amiss. Uh, there's times I've, uh, that my prayers have not been accompanied by faith. Uh, amen. There's times I've not been as persistent uh, in my prayers as I should be. I can't say that, uh, that God has always answered every single prayer I've prayed. Sometimes I've prayed and my prayers didn't even go above the ceiling because I had unconfessed confessed sin in my life and I knew it. But yet, in spite of my misguided, the, the many misguided prayers I've offered up, uh, since the time I got born again, I still have peace and ultimate, absolute confidence because I know that the whole, in my prayers, in my prayer life, because I know that the Holy Spirit serves as a filter, making sure that every aroma of prayer that ascends before the throne and rises up into the nostrils of God truly is a sweet-smelling savor rather than a rotting stench uh, as it goes up before His presence. And boy, I'd hate to think what would happen to me, what God would do. He'd probably send a lightning bolt uh, down immediately to strike me dead if one of my misguided and mistaken prayers ascended into heaven and made it before the highness and holiness of His presence. But friends, one thing you can be sure and confident in knowing is that the only prayers you pray that will ever catch the attention of your Heavenly Father are the ones we pray that are according to His will. Amen. 1 John 5. Let me, let me turn there again. I said it yesterday, but uh, amen. We don't want to skip over this. I am almost through tonight. I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. But man, I've had a time this week studying the Scriptures. Looking forward to next week. Get some rest. Uh, amen. Get recharged, get re-energized, and go right back at it. Amen. First John, chapter number five. Uh, amen. Verse number fourteen. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. Here it is that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. But it must be according to His will. You do not have to have the right or the authority to demand or command God to do anything. You're not, you're not the boss. You're not the potter. You're the clay. You're not in charge. He is. You're not a little God. Uh, amen. You, are, you do not have the, the, the right to, um, 
uh, amen, to speak things into existence. Amen. Uh, that's right. There's no such thing as a this word of this word of faith crowds of the devil. This faith faith healing bunch, and this deliverance crowd that that promotes this unbiblical and heretical idea that uh, that uh, God is somehow obligated to do everything for you that you want Him to do and that you ask Him to do. Friend, I'm telling you, a lot of the things uh, that I have asked God to do in my life, the, the, a lot of, many of the prayers I've prayed, and I'm not bragging on this. God forbid that I do that. But I'm just saying, uh, many of the things I ask the Lord to do in my life, the things that I've asked Him to give to me and do for me, you know, if I'd honestly evaluate my motive, the motives for those prayers, I'd have to say that the root of it is coming from nothing other than the old Adamic nature of my flesh, wanting things that God knows that I don't need and that are not according to His will and will not bring glory to His name. So, amen, quit asking or, or quit demanding. There's nothing wrong with asking God to deliver you uh, or to ask God to heal you. Amen, as you do so humbly, and respectively and meekly, but to command it, to de demand it, and to require it of God, somehow require it of God, as if He is obligated to do for you what you want Him to do. It's not about your will. It's not what, uh, about what you want. It's about what God wants. And regardless of what the deliverance preacher, or the faith healer preacher, the word of faith preacher, the little God preacher, or the heretical preacher, and I put them all into the same category. Tells you, sometimes the will of God for your life is for you to suffer rather than you to... And in fact, I'd say more times than not, the perfect will of God for your life is for you to suffer rather than to be healed and delivered. Why? Because God can get more glory out of your life through suffering than He ever will by way of your deliverance. But as our prayers go up and ascend into the realms of heaven, uh, and as the Holy Ghost who serves as our mediator, our advocate, and our heavenly go-between, sifts through and filters every single prayer we pray, I believe that any prayer He finds or discovers that is against, contrary, and not according to what He knows to be the perfect will of God, any time He sees one of our prayers... Uh, that are amiss. He, he, he stamps that thing. Null and void. He casts it out, chucks it. Man, I believe God's chucked. I believe the Holy Ghost has chucked a lot of the prayers I prayed before they ever ascend into the presence of God. He throws it in file 13 so as not to offend our Heavenly Father on high. Simply put, I believe the reason why so many of our prayers never make it before the throne of God and never catch the Father's attention is because they end up in heaven's garbage can because they are simply not according to the Father's will. And thank God, I bless His name tonight for the fact that the Holy Spirit knows that because I'm convinced that His mediation, His intercession, and His heavenly advocacy on behalf of our prayers saves you and I a whole lot of headache, heartache, and a whole lot of grief we would otherwise endure over our prayers and prayers we pray that are not in line and according to the plumb line of God's perfect will for our lives as His children. That's why, and I conclude, I close with these next two statements. In some strange way, we really can. And what a way to close tonight's broadcast. Uh, give old Garth Brooks credit when he said that some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And we should be grateful that misguided and misappropriated prayers are really and truly nothing more than wasted words. Praise the Lord and to God be the glory for the intercessory and the mediatory work of the Comforter on behalf of our prayers. Father in heaven, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for another privilege. Lord, as the clock strikes midnight, Amen. 
on, an, uh, on another week. Uh, Lord, thank you for your grace, God. Lord, it's not been easy. But Lord, it's been rewarding and it's been a blessing to conduct these Bible studies. And Lord, uh, Lord, you take them and do with them what you want to. Lord, if you want millions or thousands or hundreds to watch it, to see it and listen to it, that's up to you. But Father, if nobody other than myself ever watches or listens to a single one of these broadcasts, Lord, you've helped me and Lord, you've blessed me and you've matured me and grown me and strengthened my faith. And Lord, uh, help me to see things like I've never saw them before. Thank you for the, the livelihood. Uh, Lord, the invigorating, life-giving power of the fresh bread of God's Word. Lord, be with us over the weekend. Give us a good day Sunday. Lord, bless the, the morning prayer time at the courthouse here in Greenville tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would just continue to help us. Lord, uh, again... Would you cast your hand of mercy, grace, and favor upon the trumpet series? Lord, would you bless it and use it? Take your word, extol your word, honor your word, uplift your word, magnify your word, so that it may make an eternal difference in all our lives as we continue to spare not, but to cry aloud and lift up our voices like a trumpet. And we all ask all these things in Jesus' name, praising you in advance for what we truly believe you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God richly bless you as our prayers. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful weekend.